Good morning, everyone who is here so far. We will be getting started in just about one minute. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I'll cover up my own camera. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the winter 2021 meeting of the Human Services Advocacy Network, or HSAN. My name is William Tarter Jr., and I'm a fellow here at the Center for Community Solutions. Uh, today's conversation is focused on the intersection of racism and public health and the importance of learning about that intersection. Last year, after the murder of George Floyd, a number of government entities and community organizations issued declarations of racism as a public health crisis. According to the American Public Health Association, more than two dozen government entities issued declarations of racism as a public health crisis. These entities hailed from rural, suburban, and urban areas of Ohio, as well as all four corners of the state. In July 2020, Cuyahoga County Council passed legislation which declared racism as a public health crisis. Legislation which was spearheaded by then County Councilwoman and now current United States Congresswoman Chantel Brown. This legislation led to the creation of the Cuyahoga County Citizens Advisory Council on Equity, which, issue, which issued its first report in January 2021 and still meets publicly on a regular basis. Recently, however, in both Ohio and across the country, a great deal of legislation has been introduced and media oxygen given to efforts that seek to ban conversation on topics that are deemed, quote, divisive, including discussions of race and racism. These bans could potentially extend to political subdivisions, essentially government entities even beyond schools. Similarly, the effects of these legislative efforts are not limited to the classroom. This leads to a number of questions, including what are the real world implications of these legislative efforts? What is the inherent risk that could result, be it from conscious or unconscious bias, that if unchecked could negatively impact others? Does the absence of these conversations create a vacuum for meaningful conversations about racism? And what role does race and systemic racism play in the creation and perpetuation of racial disparities? These are the questions that we seek to examine today. A few housekeeping notes. Please keep your microphones on mute. This form is being recorded and a copy of the recording will be available on the Community Solutions website. The hashtag for today's event is hashtag HSAM, H-S-A-M. Questions can be submitted in the chat box or the Q&A box, and we will try and work some of those questions into the program. It is now my pleasure to turn it over to my colleague and soon to be fellow at the Center for Community Solutions, Hope Lane, to discuss what the state of Ohio is doing. She will then introduce our panelists and begin today's discussion. Hope. Oh. Appreciate you always, Will. Uh, as Will said, my name is Hope Lane and I'm a fellow of health equity with the Center for Community Solutions. I'm honored to be with you all here today, especially since H. Sands are usually hosted by Will and have truly developed into his brainchild over the years. I will be moderating the conversation today, which was largely based around the racial tensions currently in our state government and how dangerous it is for public health. Without further ado, I wanted to introduce our panelists. Uh, we are joined this morning by some of the brightest minds in our state. 
we have Representative Michael Skindell of the 13th Ohio House District, which encompasses much of Lakewood and the surrounding areas. Representative Skindell is the true definition of a public servant, having served in our legislature for over two decades. We also have with us board member Merrill Johnson, Ohio State Board Board of Education member for District 11. Ms. Johnson has a long history in public education in our state and I too wanna to thank you for your service. We also have Dr. Ronnie Dunn, Director of the Diversity Institute and the Diversity Leadership and Change Management Program and Associate Professor of Urban Studies at Cleveland State University. And last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Heather Rice, also of Cleveland State University, who is a leader in maternal and infant health research in our state. I will try and get through as many questions as I can before pausing around 1045 to see if there are any audience questions. And without further ado, we can get into it. So each of us brings our own lens to conversation about race and its role that it plays in our society historically and today. Let's start with each of your perspectives. To what end does race play a role in the work that you are involved in on an everyday basis? If you don't mind, Ms. Johnson, I'd like to start with you and you are muted. <laughs> I promised myself I wasn't going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I broke my promise. Um, I wanna thank, first of all, I wanna thank you for uh, inviting me to participate in this very important uh, panel. Um, I taught school in the Cleveland uh, district for 40 years. And so race has always been at the forefront of the work that I do. Uh, African-American children, children of color are the, are the ones who are left behind when it comes to everything. Uh, when you look at test scores, um, one of the state board members said that poverty is the issue. I said poverty may be a problem, but our African-American students score lower than Ap Ap Appalachian white students. So it's not about poverty, it's about racism and systemic racism. And so when I retired from Cleveland, I decided that I would run for the State Board of Education because I wanted to have a bigger voice to be able to advocate for public education, but mainly to advocate for our African-American students so that we can finally help them become the successful young people that they deserve to be. Thank you, um, Dr. Rice. Um, and thank you for this opportunity to be a part of this panel today. Um, I work primarily in infant and maternal mortality and African-American women in Cleveland are three to four times more likely to die from preventable pregnancy related complications. Um, these alarming statistics um, transcend across all socioeconomic status and education levels for, edu for black women. And this is in part due to the long-term psychological toll of racism that results in a chain of biological processes known as weathering and that undermines the physical and mental health for African-American women. Um, this increases African-American women's um, risk for medical conditions of, such as preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, and other mental health concerns. We also see um, primarily a lot of women uh, speaking about how they feel that structural racism has resulted in a healthcare system where their beliefs and their feelings related to their health care is subpar and they're not feeling that they're receiving adequate care or that their health concerns are being adequately addressed. And we see this not only in um, inner city women, but we also have seen this um, nationally with celebrities such as Serena Williams as well as um, Beyonce. So this is something that is experienced across the board for all African-American women. Thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Dunn, I'll remind everyone of the question again, to what end does race play a role in the work that you are involved in on an everyday basis? Uh, first, let me thank you, Hope and Will and Community Solutions for this opportunity to uh, engage in this very critically important discussion. Much of my work addresses questions of racial and social disparities as a function of institutional racism. As an urban sociologist, I approach research questions uh, from a perspective that enables me to examine the impact and help understand the manner in which race and other social variables and characteristics 
influences one's life and life chances and the opportunities that exist or that they perceive to exist uh, based on their membership in various racial, social, and cultural groups within our society. Uh, my uh, dissertation actually addressed the issue of racial profiling. Uh, so I've been immersed in this work for almost, well, over 20 years now. And actually my first scholarly publication was on racial health disparities. And I've also published in the area of racial uh, segregation and discrimination in, in education as well. So uh, it's at the core of my academic identity. Absolutely, Dr. Dunn. And, and last but not least, uh, Representative Skindell. Thank you. Uh, Hope and Will, uh, uh, I want to thank uh, you and Community Solutions to for including me in this uh, distinguished panel. Um, so I have been a, uh, uh, a civil trial attorney uh, for more than 30 uh, years. And uh, I served uh, five years on Lakewood City Council and uh, now uh, uh, I'm entering my 20th year in the Ohio legislature. Um, I, I will say when I started off as a civil trial attorney, um, I represented folks uh, in, in civil rights areas, uh, also in, in kind of injury cases. And I, I had a number of cases, for example, <laughs> Uh, dealing with uh, 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 children being exposed to lead paint in, in housing. And, um, uh, and what I saw in that, uh, that part of the practice was that uh, it was really, uh, 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 race played a, a large part in that. Um, and uh, where, where, where families and, and people were living. Uh, and as I moved into uh, uh, government service, uh, particularly uh, in the state legislature, what I see in, in every single day, uh, we are dealing with policies that somehow impact uh, race. Whether you're, you're talking about passing tax laws, uh, you're talking about uh, funding education, um, uh, you're, you're talking about uh, health policy, uh, or even economic development, where uh, uh, you're actually in economic development, you're, you're transforming a community, but you're pushing out uh, a segment of the society out of that uh, area and um, uh, uh, favoring for another uh, segment of the society. Uh, so uh, we experience this uh, all the time. And, and in my work, uh, I've tried to advocate uh, to show uh, on the floor of the House or the Senate uh, how these various policies impact uh, various uh, groups of people. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. And um, actually, on that note, I'm glad you brought that up because the next question is specifically for you um, and your tenure in the legislature. So a lot of effort around seeking to discuss the sensitive topics around race and the role that it plays in America is focused currently on education. In your expansive tenure in our legislature, can you remember any other time uh, the legislature has tried to intervene what is being taught in public schools to this extent? So for a little bit of background for our audience, Representative Skindell serves um, on the committee of uh, the House, State, and Local government committee that is currently hearing um, the legislation uh, the, uh, that's, you know, seeking to ban dis divisive concepts around race from being taught in schools. So can you remember any other time, I know you said you're on your 20th year in our legislature, uh, where this has, has been sub such a substantial issue? Um, thank you for that question. And it's a very important question. So over the years, uh, the legislature has been involved about topics uh, but not content. And I think when we're talking about uh, this issue of critical race theory or just a discussion uh, about uh, issues involving racism uh, in the United States, uh, you, they're getting into the content of the material being taught in the schools. And that's something that is extremely rare. The only area that I can think of and, and let me talk about, uh, let me back up when, when I mean about the topic. So the legislature has gotten involved and said, okay, we would like the schools uh, to teach financial literacy, uh, uh, but we've not uh, directed actually um, what that is. And we allowed the board of election, the board of education, as well as the local school boards to decide uh, what components to include in the education of, of financial literacy, the content of that. Uh, the legislature has not got involved. Uh, the only other area that I've seen involvement, which actually um, 
uh, impacts uh, and creates racial disparity is within sex education, where the legislature said uh, that in sex education, um, only abstinence only should only be taught and not a broad range of, of, of uh, contraceptive or, or uh, 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 family planning should be taught. That abstinence only meaning that uh, you, you should sustain from uh, sex until after marriage. But what we know in real society, that doesn't work. Uh, uh, so that was the only other area, but it doesn't uh, have the impacts as great as when you're talking about the overall global um, uh, racism issues or structural racism, how um, mortgage companies um, uh, kind of redline communities saying that we'll extend uh, uh, low interest mortgages in this community, but in other communities, uh, we're not going to grant the mortgages or they're going to be high interest rate uh, mortgages. Or how we uh, planned our highway system in this country to segregate uh, communities. Or how uh, we use economic development to gentrify uh, communities and try to push out uh, folks. Or how we use uh, the tax system uh, to, uh, for example, uh, uh, providing tax incentives for very wealthy families to afford higher education, but struggling uh, lower income uh, and, and minority families from uh, 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 taking advantage of those, those tax uh, incentives uh, to send their, their kids to school. Um, those, uh, uh, you know, those are very devastating. So uh, this is the first time I've seen to the extent that it is that uh, we are trying to um, uh, dictate the content of what goes into education in a broad spectrum uh, and trying to paint uh, a different version of, of America here. Uh, and, and this should be very concerning. And what plays into this is more, it's the politics of fear. And uh, I think we'll, we'll talk about this topic a little bit more uh, uh, down the line, uh, but that's uh, a large part of what's driving it. Thanks, Representative. So earlier, uh, my colleague Will outlined how the COVID-19 pandemic was able to successfully highlight on a national scale how your race alone can lead to disparate health outcomes. And for that reason and others, you know, such as police misconduct on the basis of race, uh, many communities, again, deemed racism to be a public health crisis, including many in Ohio. So do you think, um, and this is directed towards anybody, uh, do you think that the attention that is being given um, to this aforementioned legislation um, around critical race theory and um, others around the country will set the progress back. Uh, so will set us back from where we acknowledge racism as a public health crisis. Um, and then the next subsequent year in 2021, we're, we're talking about, uh, you know, banning divisive concepts. And Dr. Dunn. Uh, yes, um, thank you for, for uh, that question, Hope. I see this current attack as Representative Skindell uh, made reference to as an attack on the examination of race as a backlash, um, a political backlash in response to the historic worldwide racial justice, uh, racial reckoning movement that we saw, the Black Lives Matter movement that we witnessed in the wake of the murder of George Floyd in 2020. And that was a, a, a broad global movement in which here in the US, between 15 and 26 million Americans reportedly uh, participated in some form of protest or demonstration. So once again, I see this as the rights response to that. And that's the historic pattern that racial progress in America has always been met with, the metaphorical one step forward, two steps backwards. Uh, we saw that in the wake of the uh, Civil War and Reconstruction with the advent of Jim Crow and uh, another virtual 100 years of uh, Jim Crow segregation and pseudo slavery, if you, if you will. And then in the wake of the civil rights legislation of the 1960s, we saw the attacks on affirmative action. And then with the election of Barack Obama, the first African-American president, 
uh, that was met with the election of uh, Donald Trump. And we all know what that has wrought. And then uh, we now see this as a response to once again, the Black Lives Movement, which became, as I indicated, a worldwide movement. And, uh, and they're distorting this, what they're defining as critical race theory, which is really a distortion that they're using as a catch-all to galvanize uh, white, particularly suburban and rural Americans uh, to play on their racial fears. So I'll stop. And you know, Hope, I wanna to respond to that uh, when you talk about pu pushing progress back um, in July, 2020, uh, well, let me first of all say the State Board of Education has 19 members. 11 are elected and eight are appointed by the governor. Uh, in July of 2020, in direct response to the murder of George Floyd, uh, the State Board of Education passed a, a resolution, the complete name, it's called Resolution 20 all the time, but I, I really want to lift up the complete name of the resolution. It's called the Resolution to Condemn Racism and to Advance Equity and Opportunity for Black Students indigenous students and students of color. And I was so proud, one of my proudest moments on the board that we were able to pass a resolution in which we asked a number of things, uh, three things basically, that we would do some self-reflection by making sure the State Board of Education members had implicit bias training, that we would uh, ask the Dep Department of Education to make sure that staff had implicit bias training and that we would ask school districts to examine their policies for equity, policies like hiring practices, uh, discipline practices, and so forth. And so that was passed by a vote of 12 to five with one abstention. Very proud moment. Um, no big problems until September, October rolled around. We, we got people coming in, speaking against the resolution, saying some very uh, racist uh, things. And then we had a new member elected who decided that he felt this resolution should have been should be rescinded and this this wonderful resolution powerful strong raw uh, was rescinded on October 13th um, of, of this year by a vote of, of 10 to 7 and so that's pushing progress backwards um, but as I said after the resolution was rescinded the work's not going to stop there are people who understand the importance of this work uh, all over the state, all over the country. And um, so it's not going to stop. But I, I just, just really uh, was embarrassed uh, when people hear that we did that. Uh, they don't know that some of us voted against it. Uh, they just feel, wow, that state board is something else. So, yeah, progress is, is going backwards. Uh, Dr. Rice, any, any thoughts on... Uh on the public, uh, we're declaring racism as a public health crisis, and then, you know, subsequently uh, anti-discussion uh, on racism. I think that it was very um, encouraging when on a, net, a state level, uh, we acknowledged what was going on, particularly with public health. So it is discouraging to see that there then is some pushback, particularly when we're speaking about the education system, because if we're not transparent and open about our history, from an honest place, even if it's some things that are very difficult to discuss, then how exactly are we shaping the minds of our leaders? These mm -hmm. students will become um, healthcare providers, lawyers, um, they will work in different areas. And if they're not aware of how these different factors impact the housing, employment, um, healthcare, I mean, this transcends criminal justice system, then we will continue to see these disparities persist. And not only that, we're really not addressing what we say is the issue. If we actually want to see, um, in my area, Black babies not dying, then we have to discuss a very uncomfortable discussion that there is implicit bias amongst providers that results in African-American women's needs not being addressed. And if we don't look at it from that lens, then we fail to actually address the issue. So then it comes back to if that's just in the healthcare sector, how else does that impact everything else? I think it's, it's very unfortunate to hear Ms. Johnson that that was pushed back because that's very promising, the um, policy that was put forward. Because if it's not going to be something, it's not teaching children things that's not honest, 
it is our history. And because it is a part of our history, it shapes our future. So we have to begin to look at it, um, take some time to dismantle it and be able to move forward as a, a collective if we really wanna see some changes in our community. And Rep Skindel, yeah, I wanna make sure that you have, yeah, absolutely, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I just wanna point out is, um, so both in the Ohio Senate and the Ohio House of Representatives, um, uh, there have been uh, resolutions introduced to declare racism as a public health crisis. Uh, those uh, resolutions have been introduced by uh, the Democrats. The unfortunate part is, is uh, we can't even get hearings on those. Uh, they, pe folks don't wanna be educated on the topic. So a large part about the legislative process is to educate people. And the way you can educate people is to have uh, hearings on it, bring in um, the various sides to talk about the topic and, and to, to educate folks on it, and then for them to make a decision. Uh, but what we see in the majority is that there's not even an effort to have a discussion uh, about uh, the topic uh, and, and to hold hearings uh, on these uh, resolutions. Um, and, and I think that's a, a huge part of censorship themselves by, uh, by them blocking uh, hearings on, on the topic. Thank you, Representative. Um, Ms. Johnson, I'm glad that you brought up that resolution because that was my next question for you. Um, and so in your expansive tenure with public education in our state, both as a teacher, as you mentioned, and a student and an advocate and a board of education member, what message is sent to Ohioans who seek racial justice in America to see the state board of education withdraw that resolution that decried systemic racism and saw the resignation of the state board chair due to her stance against the racism? Um, well, I think two messages are sent. One uh, is the embarrassing message that makes people believe that the State Board of Education uh, doesn't believe that there aren't any problems with what's happening with our children of color in Ohio. Um, we, have, we have state board members who actually deny the existence of, of uh, systemic racism. So, so when you have... Um, such divisions on, on a state board of education, it's really hard for us to now be able to move in one direction. I think the other message that's sent, and I'm just gonna put it out there, that we're in a mobster kind of environment where if you, if you don't do what the governor and Senator Matt Huffman uh, want you to do, which is to get rid of that resolution uh, to condemn racism and hate, then you will be punished and, and you will be punished by being forced to resign from the State Board of Education. Uh, former board member, President Laura Kohler and former uh, board, pres uh, excuse me, board member, uh, Eric Cockler were, were very strong in their belief that this resolution needed to continue to exist. Um, we have a local uh, local decision state, so we, we, we can't force our districts to do anything, but we were strongly recommending that they examine what's going on in their, in their districts to make sure that all students uh, were being treated fairly. And so the message that gets sent is, um, people aren't gonna really take us seriously. Uh, the people that really care about what's happening with our, with our students. And that's why wherever I go, I continue to talk about the resolution. As far as I'm concerned, it has not been rescinded. It still exists. Uh, it was taken off the uh, Ohio Department of Education's website the very next day. But um, thanks to the League of Women Voters and other groups who continue to push our resolution forward, the information in here is important. And, and so I just want people, I wanna send a message that there are members of the State Board of Education who do care about the disparities that exist in this state. And we are gonna to continue to fight for students of color, African-American students and all students in Ohio. That was wonderful, thank you, Ms. Johnson. So this, this next question is for anyone. Um, in your opinion, can racial health injustices, including uh, large disparities in outcomes based solely upon race, be attributed to a lack of understanding of structural racism in society as a whole? So in other words, is talking about structural racism key to improving population health? And any, any takers? Ms. Johnson? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I have to jump on this one because when you say lack of understanding, 
it's not lack of understanding, it's denial. Um, I, I, and, and it's a lack of exposure also, especially for young children. I was asked to speak at Lake Erie College about our resolution that was rescinded. And I showed a very good uh, five minute video on the explanation of systemic racism. And, and there were 15 students in the class, uh, 14 white and one black. And so when I finished um, the uh, video, I put up sheets of paper and asked the students to go around. I put different titles on the paper, criminal justice, housing, education, health, and so forth. And I asked the students to just write examples of systemic racism that they had seen in the video on each of these sheets of paper. And so we talked about it and, and you know, did some statements of what they learned. So at the very end, one of the white students waited behind and she said to me, um, I grew up in a very small white community. She said, I never knew any of this existed. And, and so it has to do with exposure, uh, parents, especially of young children. It is so important to, to take them out of their segregated neighborhoods and to expose them to other children of other races. Uh, we've got to make this happen. Um, uh, but I, I think that is really what's, what's important um, for us to, to make this a better world. Dr. Dunn? Yes, Hope, I'd like to um, echo um, uh, Ms. Johnson's comments on the importance of uh, exposing our students of all backgrounds to uh, this history and the impact that, that race has in stratifying our society. Um, you know, in response to your question, there's a growing body of research that indicates that one's health outcomes are determined more by what we refer to as social determinants of health, which includes one education, the poverty levels, access to healthy and nutritious foods, uh, the employment, housing, transportation, environmental factors, including crime and safety that are determined a greater uh, amount of the outcomes that you have relative to health rather than your genetic makeup. So in essence, your zip code has a, is a greater determinant of, of one's health outcomes than your genetic code. Um, you know, I can't tell you how many past students that I've had that have contacted me over the past uh, two years in the wake of the uh, George Floyd murder and all of the uh, social uh, and racial protests and demonstrations and everything that we've witnessed unfolding that have contacted me from all parts of the country thanking me for uh, presenting this material to them 10, 15 years ago, and now they're seeing it manifested on, in, our, in their daily lives. And many of them are uh, out there engaged actively uh, trying to help address these, these issues. So I'm very hardened when I see and hear that. And truthfully, uh, I always have said for some time, it's the younger generation, my students and their generation that give me hope and optimism for this country and for our future. Sorry, everybody. I was going to say absolutely, Dr. Dunn, and I want to make sure Dr. Rice or Representative Skindell, if you guys have any thoughts um, about, you know, is talking about structural racism key to improving population health? Um, let me, so we, we've had various discussions uh, in the Ohio General Assembly, uh, for example, on this. And when you talk about uh, the structural racism, so uh, you look at um, uh, planning of neighborhoods and things like that, where uh, African-American neighborhoods were actually, you know, they were planned around a, 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 a garbage dump, or they were planned around a, a next to an industrial site. Uh, or they were planned around highways. Uh, and and um, now when you're trying to uh, make health situations better, this, this came up recently, uh, this, this health uh, discussion came up recently with regard uh, whether we in Ohio should get rid of the e-check program. The e-check program is to make sure that auto emissions um, 
uh, are not coming out of your car that you, if you have an older car, you get it periodically checked. Uh, so the debate is, um, do you, um, uh, the, to comply with the e-check, uh, unfortunately, uh, some low income and, and minority or senior citizens may have trouble uh, ensuring that their car uh, uh, is in compliance. But at the same time, what we're seeing is the amount of asthma uh, within children uh, in neighborhoods around the highways. Uh, and in Cuyahoga County, for example, we have one of the highest uh, 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 regions in the state uh, that derives pollutants from uh, automobile emissions. Uh, and uh, it's, it's important. And uh, those neighborhoods were built up around the highway um, uh, the uh, minority neighborhoods were built up around the highway. So it's the minority kids that are uh, impacted by uh, the negative consequences of these, these admissions. So that's just one example, but we have these discussions uh, all the time. Uh, what I like, what I see more recently, which I, I think is positive, is uh, we're getting more of discussion because uh, a number of us, uh, and particularly I, I give a lot of credit to uh, the members of the Legislative Black Caucus, really trying to bring these issues out where when I first started in the legislature, it wasn't being brought out enough, uh, but now you're seeing it uh, in the discussions a lot. And I think we need a lot more of that to, to educate people. And Dr. Rice. Thank you. I just wanted to um, add that when I think about um, being able to fully address health outcomes, I can't imagine coming with a solution that doesn't include how race impacts it in some capacity. Um, even on a level of educating nursing students about the treatment of diabetes. If we're going to talk about um, one's health, we have to also look at the barriers that have been presented that may keep them from being able to maintain certain things like being able to have access to the tools that they need, being able to implement an exercise program in neighborhoods that might not be conducive to that, being able to have access to healthy foods in the midst of food deserts. So when I think about how we actually come to some solutions and actually see that needle begin to move that those disparities are decreased, if we're not addressing it, then we're not looking at the totality of the patient. We're, we're ultimately looking at you through a lens that's been skewed and limited. And then that also will limit you as a person. We have to consider, we have to um, take it into account. And I don't believe just a basis of fear is enough reason to excuse it. Um, that means on an individual level, we need to discuss why does it cause that fear? Because for some people, they can't separate that experience from their life. That is their lived experience. So because it causes you fear, it shouldn't result in it not being something that we have to discuss and, and tackle if we truly are passionate about seeing equity. Because I believe that people discuss so much wanting to move to a society of equity and things of that sort. Well, to move there and to achieve that, we do have to have those conversations and look at how these different things um, were designed, specifically designed to cause a disparity to exist. And Hope, if I could, I'd like Absolutely. to add, um, you know, and we have to take race into consideration when we look at where we are in the midst of this this pandemic uh, with and understanding the history, when we look at the hesitancy, vaccine hesitancy within the African-American community in particular, that stems from the abuse and mistreatment and experimentation of African-Americans going back for centuries. And, uh, but most noted through the Tuskegee experiment. Uh, so if, it, but for that analysis and understanding of race, then there's no way that, uh, you know, these policies and, and uh, efforts to address the vaccine and, and the pandemic in this instance can adequately and effectively be addressed. Thank you, Dr. Don. Uh, so one of the central arguments that you all probably have heard by now in defense of banning race or uncomfortable subjects from public entities across Ohio is the mentality that merely talking about racism creates racism. Um, how do you suppose we combat that argument? 
any one or anybody want to start? Well, yeah, I'm going to start that that was really the um, that's the mentality of some of our state board members. That's why they wanted to rescind our resolution. They feel like if you uh, point out certain groups of students and do special things for them, then that's racist behavior, which, which makes no sense at all. Because when we look at our special education, our special needs students for years, I mean, it's federal government, it's law that you do special things to, to create equity, to make sure that they are getting the resources they need. And it's the same thing. If, if systemic racism has made it possible for our students of color and African-American students not to have the resources they need, then we need to do what's necessary to make sure they do have that. That's not racist. Uh, that's just being human. Uh, that's just being caring. Um, and so it's not, it's not racist at all. Um, we, the, our, our strategic plan that was designed by the State Board of Education and the Ohio Department of Education includes something called a whole child framework. And, and when you look at the whole child framework, it's basically five components. Um, we want to make sure that our children are safe, that they're healthy, that they are engaged in their classes, that they are challenged, and that they are supported. And House Bills 322 and 327 go totally against all five of those components. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, you know, that, that is a way that um, it, it could appear to be racist that we are not trying to make sure that the whole child is being taken care of. Um, that you want to point out certain students who don't like who are uncomfortable, so therefore you're going to change the whole format of, of uh, education. That's racist. So, you know, so we need to just make sure if we're doing what's right for all the students and making sure that their needs are being taken care of, then that's the solution. That's how you combat the racism uh, that's, that's going on. Anybody else want to jump in? Well, yes, I'll, I'll weigh in on that. Um, you know, there are a couple of points I'd like to make here. First, under the First Amendment, uh, uncomfortable subjects or speech, that's still protected speech. So uh, constitutionally, you know, this, this doesn't uh, adhere to the principles of, of the First Amendment. And secondly, um, you know, children of color, particularly African-American, indigenous children, uh, Asian and, and Hispanic children, black, red and brown and yellow children in this country have been subjected to this uh, ideology or notion of racial inferiority for over 400 years. And this has been perpetuated through our educational system, our K-12 educational mm -hmm. system. So, and you know, uh, the uh, historic or, or uh, seminal research of Dr. Kenneth and Mamie Clark and the uh, Brown versus Board of Education uh, uh, case, Supreme Court case, uh, illustrated the negative impact, psychological impact that uh, racial discrimination and segregation has on in that experiment, children, uh, African-American descent, uh, African-American children, but it also has an adverse impact for white children because it gives them an unrealistic and enhanced uh, sense of superiority. And as uh, Ms. Johnson had stated earlier, how it's important to expose our children that grow up in homogenous segregated communities and aren't exposed to people from other backgrounds to uh, this history and this understanding in order to prepare them to interact effectively in a global, uh, diverse global 21st century world and economy. And to do otherwise, is uh, really should be criminal and is, and it's a disservice to not only black, brown and red children or, or children of color, but to white children and all children in, in our country. Thank you for that, Dr. I, 
I see that time is, is going, but as a teacher, I cannot let my time pass without having a visual aid. So I hope you can see this book. I hope it's not backwards. Is it front? Can you see it? I mean, okay, you know how sometimes these books come out backwards. In, ten in Tennessee, there's a group called Moms of Liberty and they wanted to, ten that this law has passed in Tennessee and they wanted to have this book pass, this little 32 page baby book Ruby Bridges goes to school. And, and why did they want it uh, banned? Because of the this picture of these white people being angry and holding signs. And, and when you talk about, as far as health is concerned, it's healthy for our black students to see themselves in the curriculum because then they know they are worthwhile people who deserve to know the truth. And the white students and everybody needs to know the truth because it's our history. It's our history. And you know, we recently lost a uh, bell hook, author, poet, fabulous woman. And I wanna quote her because to me, this is what it's all about. She said, when we love children, we acknowledge by our every action that they are not property, that they have rights, that we respect and uphold their rights. And this is all about the rights of our children to be respected, to know the truth in their classrooms and to be able to have teachers who they can trust will tell them the truth. And that's what honesty in education is all about, is knowing that they have the right to, to learn the truth so that they can be productive citizens and go out there and make a difference in this country and in this world. Thank you for that, Ms. Johnson. I, I wanna make sure to give an opportunity to Dr. Rice or Representative Skindel, if you have any thoughts on how to combat, you know, how, this mentality that talking about racism creates racism. Any, any thoughts, either of you on that? I would like to add, if that statement is indeed true, then not talking about it should make it diminish then over time. If we're gonna use that as an argument and that hasn't been the case. So employing a color, um, we cannot employ a colorblind ideology in a society that is far from colorblind. And if we're gonna really tackle these issues that impact people's living, their ability to thrive in society, their ability to be able to contribute to society, um, we have to face these issues front, uh, straight, confront it head on and have those difficult conversations. I agree with Ms. Johnson that um, I don't see any harm in children seeing themselves represented in their education. Um, if you all remember a couple weeks ago, a um, illustration of an African-American fetus in a medical book caused a lot of discussion and it was interesting that I'm so conditioned to seeing in my textbooks, a particular illustration that I never reflected that there has not been an illustration of an African-American woman with a um, pregnant fetus that you see that represents you. Um, and that's how some of our textbooks, the majority of our textbooks um, are represented. So we start to think about how that conditions other things, how that, um, starts to impact the internal thoughts of children yes. where, when they begin to develop their feelings of worth and um, their importance in a society to not see themselves represented or to not see that their needs and their values are being put at the forefront and actually supported. So I don't see the harm in having those discussions. Um, they might be difficult, but I don't believe that it causes more of something that exists. Because if that was the case, then not discussing it absolutely would cause that to decrease. And it hasn't. It's still prevalent over the years. And we still see it in so many different sectors of life. Absolutely. And Representative Skindal, I didn't know if you had any thoughts on that one. Yeah, I, um, uh, I, I think we should have the discussions uh, uh, both in public settings like schools, uh, but also uh, in our homes. And, and I, I just reflect upon Thanksgiving day of this year, uh, having dinner with uh, uh, family members. Um, and the discussion came up about uh, the statues and uh, the Confederate soldiers or general statue issue. Why are we taking down these statues? These, the argument made to me was, you know, they're part of history. They should still be in, a, in the public space. And, uh, you know, I, I tried to, in the discussion, uh, without uh, 
discounting their point of view, trying to explain that those statutes, most of those Confederate statutes were not put up uh, at a time uh, to reflect our history, but rather to promote racism, uh, plain and simple, uh, to, to uh, give a sign in the public space of superiority of, of a group of, of folks. Uh, and that's what it was paid for. It was paid for by folk, folks supporting the Ku Klux Klan and being put up in the, the 1910s and 1920s uh, to promote their, their viewpoints. Uh, and uh, my uh, trying to explain that uh, these statutes should not be uh, up in the public space. Yeah, maybe uh, in some historical setting and used to talk about uh, uh, trying to put it in the right historical setting. Yeah, but not uh, to honor them in, in the public space. And so that discussion uh, we had, you know, and it goes on to the discussion about uh, the naming of, of uh, our various sports teams uh, after uh, um, uh, using uh, uh, kind of derogatory uh, uh, symbols uh, for uh, Native Americans or indigenous people. And uh, that, that, so that was a great conversation. And I, I think we, we need to learn about the histories of this and, and try to put it in context and try to have that discussion uh, across the board. Thank you, Representative. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and ask if anybody has any closing thoughts or uh, just calls to action or anything you wanna share before I turn it back over to Will to see if there's any audience questions and uh, close this out. Well, yes, uh, Hope. I, I would just like to add uh, kind of piggybacking on the representative's comments. You know, racism is a learned behavior and it, it actually starts at home. But as I indicated earlier, today's young people, they're much more open and accepting of differences. And they're, they're more inquisitive as well as socially conscious and aware. So I think what is needed in this current moment is for young people to raise their voice on this matter as well and uh, become, you know, mobilized and galvanized uh, to, to call out, uh, you know, and have those tough conversations at home around the dinner table with their parents and let them know this is the education that I not only want, but that I need and have their voice be heard. And, you know, I was able to help organize a group of students. Uh, so often student voices are not heard. Um, we have to really lift student voices in, in all issues. You know, it's just so common for adults to sit around and, and make plans for students in their schools and so forth, and then wonder why no students are coming, why it's not working. Well, it's because we didn't ask students what they wanted. And so um, I, I put together a group of about 13 students um, uh, from Westlake, Rocky River, Beachwood, Shaker, and Cleveland. Uh, and this was in direct uh, uh, response to advocate against House Bills 322 and 327. And um, they named themselves the Speak Coalition. And that stood for Students Promoting Equity and Knowledge. And I just want us to make sure that we hear the student voice in this forum this morning. Uh, Kayla Blake is a student. I had them ask them to write letters to the editor and 10 out of the 13 were able to write letters to the editor and they've been placed in a lot of different community newspapers and so forth. But I just wanna quote from Kayla Blake who is a student at the Cleveland School of Science and Medicine. She said, the goal is to create a, and in quotes, more perfect union not teach that our current union is flawless. I wish to see a more fair and objective school curriculum that includes the voices of people who look like me in addition to acknowledging the complex history of America and the racism built into the fabric of it. And that's from Kayla Blake, an African-American student, Cleveland School of Science and Medicine. And we have to make sure that we give, uh, that we give provide space for, for students to speak up because it's, it's about them. It's not about us. It's about our students and they need to be uh, full-fledged participants in this fight. Thank you. Representative Skinner. Uh, thank you. So one of the things I, I, I fear is with regard to the, the two uh, pieces of legislation uh, titled critical race theory 
uh, the House Bill 322 and, and also House Bill 327 is uh, um, it's on a track of, 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 of passing at least through the House of Representatives, uh, maybe even this spring. So, uh, you know, there should be a call to action for people to write to the legislative leaders, write to the members of the committee, write, write to your own state representatives or state senators, say, let's stop this. One of the real concerns of this legislation is that it will instill fear uh, in teachers and administrators in schools because they won't know what to teach and they, they won't uh, engage in certain uh, uh, conversations at all because they would be fearful of the penalties associated with that, that legislation. Um, uh, and that needs to be stopped. The other thing is, uh, uh, again, a call to action is the, um, the two resolutions, one in the Senate, one in the House that declares racism as a public health crisis. Uh, we need to hold hearings on it. And again, people should contact their legislators, the legislative leaders, leg uh, the legislative committees that those bills are pending in and say, let's hold hearing. Let's have a discussion. What are you afraid of in holding a discussion about uh, these, these resolutions? And uh, uh, people should reach out to their legislators because what the state legislators are doing in Columbus these days are impacting all of our lives at the local levels. I know, I know I spoke already, but Representative Skindell mentioned the penalties, but he didn't tell what they are. And people need to know that teachers can actually lose their teaching license if they are caught uh, teaching the wrong thing and school districts can lose their funding. And, and so I just need to put that out there. This stuff is serious. And Dr. Rice, if you had any closing thoughts for us. I'm just building on what's already um, been stated and reinforcing the importance of supporting the legislation that moves to not allow these things to happen. I think it's, it's a perfect time for people to use your voice. If you do have children that are very passionate about this, I love that letter that was written by that um, young person. I think that's what needs to be heard. I think that their voices need to be um, put at the forefront and support them so that they're able to use um, panels, social media, because I don't believe a lot of people are really aware um, that this is even going on. So thank you for this opportunity and this um, panel that was designed to bring light to this issue because um, a lot of things that I even learned today, I was not aware of. So um, I began to gather those that I know are also passionate about this so that we can write letters and that we can hold the people accountable that need to be held accountable so that things are not just happening at the state level and then it trickles down and it impacts our children and then it ultimately will impact the health of our community. And Will, if you don't mind uh, closing us out today, I would really appreciate that. I also just want to thank you all for joining me. I've learned a lot too. Um, and I was so excited when Will gave me the opportunity to, to think through this panel. I said, well, we need Representative Skindell. Obviously, he's on the panel. And that was, remember, Will, that was exactly what I was saying. And I was like, I need board member Johnson. Do you remember? And, I, and you were like, I don't know, she hasn't been. And, and I was like, no, we need her. And then I was so lucky to have these two wonderful uh professors of color to join us. I, I just I just love this. Um, Will, go ahead. Uh, thank you so very much uh, to all of you for this very engaging, raw, and enlightening, important conversation. Uh, on behalf of the Center for Community Solutions, we want to thank our panelists, a State Board of Education member, Merle Johnson, State Representative Mike Skindle, Dr. Ronnie Dunn and Dr. Heather Rice for joining us as our panelists. Thank you to Hope Lane, my colleague who did a great job moderating today's conversation. We wanna thank our audience to all of you for attending today's conversation that really sought to examine the importance of learning and understanding the intersection of race and public health. We encourage our audience to check out the Center for Community Solutions website for a copy of this recording as well as reports and analysis on what can be done to reduce some of the racial disparities that we discussed today. Again, we wanna thank all of you for attending today's meeting of the Human Services Advocacy Network. We want to wish you all a safe, happy, and healthy holiday season. Thank you so much, have a great weekend.